We flew our first mission on the 4th of July. And then we, uh, we had missions over Germany and went over Holland and so on. I think somewhere in this information I'd given you that you have a list of all of my missions and so on. But on one of those missions, I happened to be flying waste gunner that day. And uh, I happened to look up to the radio room and the radio, op radio operator's head was on the table. So I called the pilot and told the pilot I thought something was wrong with the radio operator. I hooked up the walk around bottle, the oxygen bottle, and went up into the radio room and his oxygen hose had been shot, it was disconnected took the emergency mask off the side and put it on his face and fortunately I got it on before he, he passed out because he would have been he would have been dead. We're coming back over the over the target. We just dropped our bombs. We're coming home and we're still over the target. And we had the left hand bomb bay, the bombs had not dropped. The pilot calls up and again I'm flying waste this day. The pilot calls up and says, Can you get the bombs out, or words to that effect. So I went up into the bomb bay and I have to give you a picture of this. The bomb bay doors are open and on the left hand side of the plane is a step. That you, I put my foot on that step and my other foot on the, on the walkway that goes through the bomb bay. I had an oxygen tank on with no, no May West or no armor, you know, no vest, flak vest. We're 25,000 feet and I have this hook that you have to reach up into the bomb bay and pull the shackles together so that the bombs drop. Well, here I am at 25,000 feet on the oxygen bottle looking down seeing a flak coming up and I'm trying to get hold of these bombs to pull them out. Left hand side was a little bit of a problem. I got those out then got the other side out so they all went down and got back in a plane called to call their pilot and said they were all gone. Well that particular situation didn't hit me until we were on the ground and when I realized that here I am 25,000 feet looking straight down seeing a flak coming up. Wow, well, you know, what a, what a situation. He asked me whether or not I knew how to run the bobsled and I said yes I did. So I went up in the nose of the plane and got in, on the bomb site. And we're looking for a target of opportunity because we I should have prefaced this. We were we went to the rendezvous point and we were late, so we we couldn't hook up with a group. So we decided to try it on our own because we weren't too afraid of fighters because they weren't too much of a problem at that point. Anyway, I went up in the bomb site. And we're looking for this target, and I said, look out ahead, and there's a string of barges along this canal. So I call him off to the, to the pile and say, Brownie, see the barges up there. Can you hit them? I say, well, I, say, I think so. So I get down on the bomb site, set it all up, set the bomb site for, for train rather than salvo. And when the indices came together, out went the bombs and went right up that string of barges. So we turned around, went home, we got credit for the mission. They were actually, they were actually uh, uh, free gunners, really. Well, four guys if you count the engineer. And the engineer had a top turret. He was up in front behind a pilot and co-pilot. And he came back into the waist and it was a waist gunner, which I paired off with a ball gunner. And we had a tail gunner. And a waist gunner was movable. He could move around pretty much. Uh, he wasn't stationary like the ball gunner or like the tail gunner. And the ball gunner was in a position where he, he had he moved the turret by moving the handles on the turret, which made the turret revolve. And he could move the turret down and up. And the tail gunner, he was in a different situation. He was practically flat, and he was in a different situation entirely. Now the <coughs> waist gunner, again, had pretty good range from 180 degrees, but uh, that was, that was basically the three gunnery I really positions. I wanted to be a pilot. Okay. That's what I really wanted to be. But if I remember correctly, when we went through, uh, only the very, very top 
part of the class was being classified as pilots because the I, I, the way I hear the story was that there weren't as many pilots shot down as they expected. So then they were in a group, they could take the top. Then there was the navigators and the bombardiers. I guess the bombardiers were on the bottom, really. And uh, well, that was the bombardier. And then the navigator. And uh, it was one of the biggest disappointments in my life that I didn't get to a point where I could be what I wanted to be. Um, my navigation in the air was just about perfect. But on the ground, I could not do the problems. So I washed out on the basis of ground of, of ground groundwork, not not aerial work. And I wound up they sent me to engineering school after I washed out. Then the engineering school closed up, so I went up again as a gunner. And I wound up, you know, but then I think of fate, if I had been a bombardier, maybe I wouldn't well, be. The here. name of the plane was the Fiery Phantom. And it was a um, a figure of a, of a, like a skeleton with a cape and a scythe in his hand. And it was like red, white, and, and it was red, red and blue on a black background. Well, when we first met him, uh, we had a meeting with him. And he told us right then, he said, if any of you guys want to be heroes, he said, uh, don't fly with me, or words to that effect. He said, I have two missions. He says, to drop bombs and bring, it, bring us back safely. And which is what he did. Now, as a pilot, uh, he had a lot of the fellows in the particular group or our squad a little upset because he'd fly so tight. And he wasn't a, a throttle jockey. He wasn't up and back, up and back. He one steady, one steady speed. The ground crew loved him because he didn't wear out the engines, for instance. And then in combat, he was always when they're really tight. So that if the fighters came in, they would probably miss our particular section and hit, hit another one because of our, the way he flew. And the other thing we liked about him, he loved peanut butter. So we used to call him the, we used to call him the peanut butter kid. <laughs> and he finished his missions uh, before we, a couple of us did because he had those orientation missions at the beginning. So he flew maybe two or three missions before we got together. But um, came back to California and uh, he owned a bus company there. And it wasn't too long after he was back. No, I shouldn't say too long. Maybe he was back four or five years and he finally passed away. So uh, he's a good guy, you know, but he was very tight on the decorations. The radio operator always wanted him to put me in for a, a decoration for saving his life. And I thought he should have made some recognition for me getting up in that bomb bay and dropping the bombs and also going to the bomb site. No way. I and mean, he just wasn't that type of person. In other words, you did your job. That was that period. And that period. Co-pilot, he was from California. He always wanted to be a fighter pilot. But he was a good pilot, and we never had a problem with him. He just wanted a crew. Navigator was a nice guy. He was, on his first mission, he got hit right at the corner of his eye. So he got a Purple Heart, and he missed one or two missions with us. And the bombardier, fortunately, he's still alive at 96. And he was just part of the crew, you know. His name was Burry. We used to call him Dingle. Dingle Burry. <laughs> <laughs> and as of this particular moment, uh, all of these fellows are dead except the bombardier, which is, you know, Barry and myself. All of them have, have gone on. By the time that I flew, or we flew our first mission, or our missions, it was right after D-Day. And, uh, of course, by that time, the ground forces had already landed in France. And consequently, the, the fighter fields, the German fighter fields, had all been moved back further into France or into Germany. But what would happen then, the flat guns were moving back also. 
So when, when the fighters would come over and meet the, the planes in the beginning over the channel, we didn't have that. As soon as we got into German territory, we had a lot of flack because they were moving guns all back. And <laughs> the shells are set to explode at a certain height. And you could see them come up and they looked like a big black blossom. It would be a big round thing and then flat at the bottom most of the time. And you could hear the shrapnel, you know, hitting the plane. And sometimes it wouldn't be so bad. And other times it, you'd wonder how the hell are you going to get through. Well, it was set on gyros. And when you, when you turn, when the pilot turned it over to you, when you were on a bomb run, you were actually flying the plane by manipulating the knobs on the bomb site. So you have your head looking in through the scope, you know, the eyepiece, and you're working the knobs until you get these indices set. And once they're set, this one little thing comes up, and then when it hits the cross piece, that's when the bombs go out. But once it's hanging there, I mean, you, you're, you're dead on. And, so, if, and if we were shot down, in the beginning anyway, we, the, the early crews carried 45s, pistols. And if they were shot down, a bombardier was supposed to put his gun in the, what's the name, and blow that northern bombsite all to pieces so the Germans wouldn't get it. Now in the beginning, the pilot, you know, the, the bombardier was right up there in the front, and he's looking at all that flak, and he came, has to disregard the flak to look at that bomb site. He's got his head buried on that bomb site waiting for those indices to come together. And he can't be worried about the flak, otherwise he's not doing his job. So as soon as those indices hit, the bombs go out, and he can kind of sit back and relax a little bit, depending upon what the situation is. The pilot turned the plane over to you. You had these two knobs, as I say, and they were gyros. So when you're working them, you're also working the attitude of the plane in order to get it set up on your target. So actually, we, you, at that particular time on that bomb run, you be, almost became the pilot. Mm -hmm. So you're piloting the plane by manipulating these gyros. Okay? Gotcha. And once that, as I say, once those indices came together, bombs would drop out and your job was done in America speaking. The most memorable experience was being up in that bomb bay yeah pulling the bombs out. I mean, that was one of the scariest parts of my whole life. I realize that now, not so much, then it didn't, didn't occur to me. But in after years, thinking about that, looking down, there's nothing down there, you know? Your legs are spread apart. You're looking down, you're seeing the flat come up, you're hearing it hit the, hit the plane, and you're up there trying to get these bombs out, and, and you don't have a chute on, because we had chest chutes, all I had on was this walk-around bottle, and that, that was it, period. I mean, that's, that's the thing I remember most, being up there like that. So, I don't know. Thank God that I didn't become a bombardier. <laughs> and I'm here to sit here and tell you this story. It's your time. Like, I have, a, I have a feeling about that. When God turns the page over and your name's on it, that's it. You're, it's all you wrote. And that's what I'm saying, thankfully that I didn't get up there in the plane as a bombardier. They, maybe they, I they swore me in when I was 17, but then they sent me home for about uh, two months to become 18. And uh, went down to Maxwell Field, Alabama, pre-flight. Uh, went through okay. It was a big, big class. And uh, we passed okay. Most of us passed uh, in the school. And we went to primary uh, flying school. We f flew uh, the uh, PT-17, and then they changed us over to the uh, uh, Fairchild that was just coming out. Uh, of course, the B uh, PT-17 was a plane that you could really fly, and the uh, Fairchild was like a kite. It just flew through the air. But anyway, we made it through. Uh, primary, went to basic. Uh, we were fortunate then because we had an, an English pilot who had flown combat already, and P.J. Hay Hood was his name. And uh, half of our class in primary school was, uh, was English. Uh, and we got through okay, had, had a lot of fun. 
and they sent us to advanced school in uh, single engine uh, AT6s. Uh, it was a sad, pretty sad affair for me because uh, in about the third day I was there, they uh, called me in to take a flight for the first flight in the in the AT6, and uh, we took off, and I bounced a little bit and squirved a little bit, came down and landed, and they said they were going to wash me out. Uh, they said they were sorry they had to do it; they couldn't wash me back, but they had a full class coming in the next time and no room for me. So one one flight in the AT6, they, they got rid of me and sent me to navigation school down in Hondo, Texas. Eight o'clock, they came pounding on the door, woke me up, said, get ready to fly home in an hour. Uh, it so happened that uh, one of their other officers that are uh, in the uh, maintenance uh, department had been flying a test flying a uh, repair on a B-17 with his crew and uh, said, uh, oh, let me show you how I used to fly the Spitfires. He, he was uh, had been in the Canadian Air Force with the Spitfires and flown a uh, pretty good tour of duty there. So he came down and uh, a little low and he hit a haystack with the turrets on the B-17, the bottom turrets. <coughs> and it just so happened that General LeMay, uh, Le General Curtis LeMay uh, was looking out a window, got the tail marker on the plane and uh, got on the phone, called the uh, field, said, I want that man court-martialed. Well, he was so well-liked that uh, he, had, he had a couple missions to finish, which he did. And uh, th then they decided to send him home. Uh, for me, uh, the mission I f uh, finished up on the next day, they came knocking on the door and said, get up, you're flying home in an hour. So I flew as navigator with them coming on home. We went down and got the the plane strip, stripped uh, and uh, then flew on to Africa, flew down to the middle of Africa, Dakar, and then over to uh, South America, he came up and uh, landed in Florida. So I ended up as a uh, class uh, lieutenant, actually, uh, teaching navigation school. After uh, quite a few months, I got bored and decided I wanted to go back to, to England and uh, le left the school and uh, joined the crew that was flying over. It was just uh, two of us, three of us on the crew, pilot, co-pilot, and navigator. And we flew a 17 over to uh, Africa and then up to Italy. We saw one fighter the whole time we were in Italy. Uh, we flew maybe 20 missions at the time. <coughs> that shows you how good that the uh, the colored boys were because they were our escort. Came home, and uh, Korea came along, and uh, went to the uh, recruiting office. A captain, and do you think they'll call, recall me? Uh, I would like to get married, and uh, I won't if uh, if I'm going back in the service right now. They said, there's no chance, you got too much rank. So I went home and got married. And uh, about a week later, I got a letter from the Air Force saying, we want you back. <laughs> <laughs>
the, the usual thing. Uh, went to Korea. Uh, it was an entirely different war, but it was an entirely a different uh, war for us, for the Air Force. It was quite a bad war for the It's a lucky Force. bastard club. Uh, club. And uh, our group had uh, had it for finishing your tour over there alive. <coughs> I, I got it for 27 missions completed. These are a couple pictures of me when I was taken into the service. Uh, this is Maxwell Field, <coughs> pre-flight school uh, for all the all the type flyers or pilot uh, the uh, officers anyway. Um, go to pre-flight for pilot training for uh, before pilot training and uh, bombardier school, uh, navigation school. These are, this is the hideous delight here. Both pictures here. This is when I finished, the day after I finished my tour in England. Happened to be a dog, little puppy that the uh, photographer had down there. And this is my crew. Right after a mission. And this is a crew uh, picture with the after, right after the mission with with the photographer that uh, took took the pictures. <coughs> One of the pictures uh, right over the field of P fifty one coming coming across, and a couple of combat pictures really uh, on on the way to a mission. It happened to be a pretty black if, if you take and figure that the flak is like a grenade, only it's much bigger. Yeah. And when you throw the grenade, it goes off at a certain time. That's why you have to hold the pin for a certain time. Anyway, the gunners on the ground will have some ideas of what your altitude is. So they'll send some shells to that particular altitude. Others they'll go high, others will go below or around you. So when you're going through, all these shells are breaking basically at the same time, only at, at different heights. So when you're flying through that, uh, if the bombardier, lead bombardier has much, he can't maneuver the plane too much because of the bomb site. He, he's on his target, so they have to fly through it. And yeah, the pilot, I, same thing. And the, she the shell itself doesn't have to hit the plane. It, it's the pieces that... Well, if, if, if the shell itself hits your plane, that's all she wrote, yep. you know, you blow up. But it's like, a, like you take a coal shovel full of coal and just throw it up in the air and you hear it coming down and on a tin roof, only this time it's not a tin roof, it's sharp and it comes right through the plane, you know, tears everything up. Go ahead, Harry. Yeah, a piece of flak, I had uh, hit my hand one time. It came came into the plane, hit the table, went out, up and hit the wall, and came down and bruised my hand. I, I couldn't get a, a you didn't metal, get a metal because it didn't bleed. <laughs> <laughs> I carried that thing around with me for a year and a half, I think, before I lost it. Well, I have I have a piece that's about maybe two inches, and another little piece might be a half inch. I had my shoes sitting in the in the waist because when you're bailing out, you're supposed to take those shoes with you because you have these heavy boots on. Anyway, Were make you barefooted. Point. Yeah, I was barefooted. This piece of shrapnel came in and went through three sides: two sides of the one shoe and one side of the third sh of the other shoe, and landed in there. And that's how I still got it. It's about that big. And you run your finger on the side, man. It's sharper than a razor blade, you know. So that's the kind of stunt junk that's coming through, you know. Some of you you want to go first, or you want me to go first? I don't know you. 
<laughs> That's the nature of our friendship, you see. I don't know him and he doesn't know me. Uh, right. We met, met down in uh, Randall's town. Uh, at Dunkin' Donuts shop. Yeah, what time? Uh, at, when I was uh, 65, I don't know. Uh, well, I'm uh, 10 years older than you are, so I had to be sick. Yeah. <laughs> I guess the friendship is going on now, I guess, 15 years anyway, you know. And I met Harry over coffee, and we both knew we were in the Air Force. So that was our that was our get together, more or less. And it just kind of you want to quote blossom from there. I mean, yeah, I know what yeah. kind of blossom you can. And call we it, worked at Rowland, really. To yeah, we worked at Rowland together, and and uh, and just a friendship. It just yeah. I don't know he puts up with me, and I put up with him. And one thing I have to say: a few years back, Harry unfortunately had a slight stroke and we all thought man he was going to be gone right but god loves him came through and you never told me well <laughs> he didn't come down and tell you i'm no. telling you but the only thing that's happened is he slightly impaired hearing and now he's getting getting a little crotchety you know but he's still with us okay ah my legs are going mm -hmm. So it's a, well, it's another story. Right into the trunk. Oh my. You know, this driving machine of yours. I mean, what about, don't you have a little women chasing you? Well, to be very honest, doctor, I wish it were true. But just in case, I carry that cane in the back. If they should happen to chase me, <laughs> I can beat him off. He, I understand. He, he would leave. He would welcome him. I, I can understand. You guys take care. Okay. okay. We'll talk to you.